Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to All 24 News Midnight News Program, live from Algiers. Next are the headlines. President of the Republic receives U.S. Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. Also coming up, the Tunisian presidency rejects its accusation of racism against African immigrants and announces a package of measures to facilitate their residence. Also ahead in our program, Zionist occupation forces shoot and arrest many Palestinians and impose closures on the West Bank and Gaza crossing during Jewish holiday. And Iran has agreed to enhance cooperation with the International Atomic Energy Agency as it carries out its verification and monitoring activities. Hello again and welcome to the program. First off in our news, President of the Republic, Mr. Abdel Majid Tiboun, received on Monday in Algiers the Sheikh of Tariqa Tijania or Tijania Order in Nigeria. Sheikh Tahir Uthman Bawshi, according to a press release from the Presidency of the Republic. The audience took a place at the headquarters of the Presidency of the Republic in the presence of the Principal Private Secretary to the Presidency, Mr. Abdelaziz Khalaf, and the Project Manager at the Presidency of the Republic, Mr. Hassouni Mohammed. Still with president activities, Algerian president Mr. Abdul Majid Tabun also received on Monday Ms. Boney Jenkins, U.S. Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. According to a presidency statement, the audience took place in the presence of the principal private secretary to the presidency, Mr. Abdelaziz Khalaf, and the advisor to the president of the Republic in charge of affairs related to defense and security, Mr. Boumedien Binatou. In Algeria still, Major General Chief of Staff of the National People's Army, Mr. Saeed Shingriha, began on Monday a work-in and inspection visit to units of the 4th Military Region. The Major General hailed the commendable initiatives of the President of the Republic aimed at consolidating the regional and continental role of Algeria, which is constantly working to be a stabilizing actor in the region and contribute to the sustainable development of neighboring countries. Algeria has always sought to help African countries to maintain their stability and security and to accompany them in settling their security situation by internal means and solutions, respecting the sovereignty of states and refusing to interfere in their local affairs, in addition to providing assistance in various military, economic and humanitarian fields. Hence the wise decision taken by the President, announced during the 36th Summit of Heads of States and Governments of the African Union held recently in Addis Ababa, comes in contribution to pump $1 billion in order to activate the African solidarity mechanism and to contribute to the development in the African continent, because security and peace cannot be achieved in Africa without effective development. Still with Algeria, but this time economy, the share of Algerian gas in the Italian market has risen to 37 percent. At the same time, Algeria's fertilizer exports to European Union countries increased by more than 60 percent, placing Algeria as the third largest supplier to Europe during the past year. Here's Selman Asib with more. Algeria is strengthening its position more and more on the European market. In fact, it managed to acquire a significant share of energy imports and its derivatives. For instance, nearly 85 of Algeria's gas exports are already designated for Europe. Among the European partners, Italy managed to benefit from Algeria's gas suppliers substantial. As a matter of fact, Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni's visit was highly anticipated and was publicly promoted as an indication of the significant strengthening of bilateral ties. This paved the way to extending Italy's shares of natural gas in order to cover 37% of Italy's needs in 2022. 
That's not all. Algeria's export to Europe were not limited to gas only. In truth, it extended also to fertilizers. For example, during the first 10 months of the year 2022, Algeria recorded an increase of more than 60% by 1 million and 19,000 tons. This makes Algeria thus the third largest supplier of the European bloc, preceded by Russia, which occupies the lead in the volume of exports with 3 million and 52,000 tons with a decrease of 14%. Egypt comes in the third place among fertilizer suppliers to Europe, with 1,094,000 tons, and an increase of 22% during the first months of the year 2022. Algeria continues to be the biggest exporter for Italy so far, as fertilizer exports increased by more than 160% during the first 10 months of 2022, and exports recorded nearly 2,000 tons. Indeed, Algeria is not only hoping for additional gas revenues, but hopes to become one of the EU's essential energy suppliers. Still in our topical news, the Algerian News Service, uh, or uh, aka APS, that is the Algerian News Agency, has confirmed that the Mahzen regime's new move that instructed one of the media close to the royal palace in Rabat to publish a propaganda file that lacks any media professionalism reflects the expansionist goals through assumably annexing parts of the Algerian soil to the kingdom. The agency confirmed that it was not a random act as it came only days after the Royal Documentation Director's statement in Rabat about the same subject to revive a useless debate which was arbitrated under the conventions of the United Nations. The agency added that according to observers, the Moroccan provocation is only a continuation of the Mahzen regime's strategy that seeks to create tensions and internal problems to deflect the sights of the Moroccan people over the internal issues amid ongoing protests that are growing every day while the authorities are absent and are waiting the instructions of their king who is living outside the country for months. Meanwhile, Moroccan people accused the head of the government of exploiting citizens and, and leading them to extreme poverty via his companies. Moving on now, Tunisia intends to implement a plan of about 17.7 billion US dollars by 2035 or 35, I'm saying, in order to achieve energy security for the country and promote green economy. The plan includes the completion of the Italy Tunisia Electricity Inner Connection Project, in addition to investment to produce about half of the country's electricity from renewable sources. Zara Frigeni reports. In order to reach future energy needs, Tunisia aspires to achieve energy security by 2035. In a press conference, Tunisian Minister of Industry, Energy and Mines Neila Gunji unveiled the government's proposed plan to allocate about $18 billion into fossil energy projects and renewable energies. What we aspire to is for the strategy to achieve energy security with capabilities that we consider national. It takes into account the development of renewable energies and energy efficiency, as well as the economic dimension. This strategy aims to increase about two points in the country's gross domestic product and to create more than 70,000 job positions in the next decade. We take into account the social dimensions such as energy vulnerability so that energy reaches the lowest cost for all citizens to include all the Tunisian territory. We aspire to enable this strategy to create job opportunities for more than 70,000 citizens, including 30,000 direct jobs around 2035, which enables to increase the growth rate by 2%. The investments in this plan include the completion of the Tunisian interconnection project with Italy before 2027 and raising electricity production from renewable sources to 50%, equivalent to 8,350 megawatts. We are in the process of preparing investment opportunities related to the renewable energy sector because Tunisia has strong competitive advantage in this field. We have an agreement in the solar energy sector that has a large dimension, which is the electricity interconnection line that connects Tunisia with Italy. It will enable us to export to renewable energy. The Tunisian energy security strategy, which includes drilling about 30 wells, is an indication of Tunisia's continued investment in fossil resources, as well as development of the electricity network, which enables it to supply more than 1,200,000 people with energy. 
Tunisian authorities announced on Sunday measures to improve conditions of foreigners in Tunisia. The presidency, the government and the Foreign Affairs Ministry announced a relaxation of visa rules for African citizens, allowing stays of up to six months instead of three without seeking residency and of a year for students. It's worth mentioning that migrants who had overstayed could leave without paying penalty fees of about $25 per month. Still in Africa, the head of the Libyan National Unity Government, Abdul Hamid Adbeba, said that Libya had recovered its natural position in the regional and African map. Speaking at the scientific forum organized by the Economic Council of the African Union in Tripoli on Monday, Adbeba stressed that the scientific forum is the highlight of an African participation that Tripoli has been witnessing for more than a decade. <laughs> Your distinguished African presence today as we meet in Tripoli and in the most prominent African participation in more than 10 years in Libya, which is hosting the work of this council, is an affirmation of the African depth of our country, that the Libyans have not abandoned and whose positions in support of stability and the development have not changed. This African position in support of the stability of Libya and national reconciliation inside and outside Libya enables it to recover and restore its natural position in the map of regional African and Maghreb activities and forums. Still with Libya updates, President of Libya's Supreme State Council, Khaled al-Mashri, said on Monday that the council was fighting a political battle with the House of Representatives, accusing it of attempting to jump into an absolute legislative authority. In a press statement, al Mishri renewed the Supreme State Council's refusal to waive the conditions for preventing dual nationals and military candidates while calling for a change in the High Electoral Commission before the elections, calling for the formation of a unified mini-government to oversee the entitlement. To other news now, four terrorists fled a prison in Mauritania's capital, Nouakchott, following an armed attack that killed two policemen. The Mauritanian Ministry of Interior explained on Monday in a statement that the operation was carried out after the terrorists fleeing from the prison had been able to attack the prison guards, leading to an exchange of fire during which two other national guards were killed. The Vice President of Transitional Sovereignty Council General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalu renewed the state's commitment to implement the Juba Sudan Peace Agreement, calling for showing sincerity of intentions and in implementing the agreement. General Dagalu, during his address at the High Security Academy in Khartoum, called for the need to pay attention to peace issues, especially the issue of the displaced and refugees and their return to their original villages, urging the militants to join the country's peace process. To the Middle East now, four Palestinians were shot and wounded by the Zionist occupation on Monday and another four dozens were arrested following the occupation forces raid into a camp in southern Jericho. This comes at a time when the occupation announced a total closure on the occupied West Bank, including land crossings in the Gaza Strip, until midnight, that is, on Wednesday night. Here's Islam Said with more. The Zionist entity intensified its aggressive behavior towards Palestinians. Its forces demolished more homes and schools in the West Bank. Several other Palestinians were ordered to stop construction work on their homes and other structures. Four Palestinians got injured by Zionist forces with live bullets when the soldiers broke into a camp south of the east and west bank city of Jericho. These violations do not stop here. According to sources, the Zionist occupation is imposing a total blockade on the occupied West Bank which also includes the closure of the Gaza Strip's land crossings. 
from Monday to Wednesday. The Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Shtia warned that these practices make Palestinians face systematic state terrorism. The terrorism of the occupier in Hawara and the rest of the villages, Syria's camps, and every place is supported and protected by the Israeli government and the occupation army. We are facing organized and systemic state terrorism that is implemented through several tools, the most important of which is the occupier's gangs. Meanwhile, Zionist settlers continue their attacks after they stormed the neighborhood in Ramallah and performed religious rituals in the area under the protection of the security forces. Breaking into Palestinian homes and camps, killing and capturing the residents became a common practice for the Zionist occupation and met repeated calls for the international community and continuous condemnation from several countries over the Zionist acts that terrorized Palestinian population. Moving on now, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, confirmed on Monday that there is a good opportunity to work with Iran, while Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman Nasser Kanani confirmed that his country had reached understandings with the agency and that Tehran is ready to return to nuclear talks. Sofian Kanturi has the full story. Let's follow. On the side of the Board of Governors of the Atomic Energy Agency meeting, which began on Monday in Vienna, to discuss files including the Iranian nuclear one. Head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, said the agency and Iran reached agreements in the nuclear program file, which he described a constructive path towards the beginning of a new phase. I would like to say that I'm neither optimistic nor pessimistic. I think we are on a constructive path. We have confidence, but we check everything here at the agency. I'm not disturbed or dissatisfied. I think we are at the beginning of a new phase. It is not only a new process, but it is a new phase after we reach specific agreements. For its part, Tehran also confirmed that it had reached understandings with the AEA in preparation for resolving outstanding issues, expressing its readiness to return to nuclear negotiations with all parties, including Washington. We reached good agreements with the IAEA that can permit to us to solve technical issues that are still stuck. We are responsible and ready to go back to nuclear talks with all parties, including Washington. And let us exchange between Iran and the United States is still ongoing. The Supervision Operation Decision in Fordo Institution is one of the Global Assurance Agreements. China also hailed on Monday the recent agreements between Iran and the AEA, emphasizing all the successful ongoing negotiations. China appreciates the consensus reached between Iran and the International Atomic Energy Agency on strengthening cooperation on the Iranian nuclear issue. We also hope that the above-mentioned consensus will be effectively implemented and a good atmosphere will be created for advancing the Iranian nuclear negotiations. Earlier, Zionist premier was bothered by the statement of the AEA head in which he said the implementation of Zionist attack on nuclear facilities in Iran is illegal. This comes one month after Tehran accused the Zionist entity of being responsible for drone attack on military site in the city of Isfahan. To the latest in the Russia-Ukraine file now, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu visited Mariupol on Monday as part of his working visit to areas of Russian special military operations in Ukraine. According to a statement by the Russian Defense Ministry, Shoigu inspected new facilities and the progress of the work at the sites of buildings and structures under construction. The minister also appreciated the military work of the construction complex and thanked the military personnel involved in the restoration of social infrastructure in the Donbas region. Still with the same file, the Ukrainian presidency said on Monday that President Volodymyr Zelensky discussed with military leaders the situation in Bakhmut. During the discussion, the commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian armed forces and the commander of the ground forces demanded the need to continue defending the city, which is besieged by Russian forces, by advancing defensive operations and strengthening the positions of the Ukrainian army in the region. 
Speaking in Jordan on Monday, UN Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said the city of Bakhmut was more of a symbolic value than tactical significance. His comments come as Russian forces continued advancing in eastern Ukrainian city and providing more troops to reach triumph. Austin also stressed that even if Bakhmut fell to the Russian side, it would be seen as a major victory. A contested area for several months. The Russians have desperately tried to uh, to seize Bakhmut, uh, and over several months they have not made much progress. I attribute that to the the courage, the valor of the Ukrainian forces, um, and uh, and how this goes going forward is 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 left to be seen. I think uh, both both uh, sides are really leaning into this in a major way. The ruling Liberal Reform Party, to which Prime Minister Kaya Kalas belongs, topped the results of the parliamentary elections that took place in Estonia on Sunday. The Electoral Commission of Estonia announced the victory of the Liberal Reform Party with 37 of the 101 seats in Parliament, three more than they did four years ago. In contrast, the far-right Conservative, Conservative People's Party of Estonia came in second place, with 16 commas, 1% of the vote. To Pakistan now, at least nine police officers were killed and 11 others were injured. Three remain in critical conditions and are receiving hospital treatment due to a suspected suicide bomber. And according to the authorities, it is the latest in a string of recent attacks against security personnel in the South Asian nation. A spokesman for the Pakistani police reported that 15 others were wounded during the suicide bombing. In the sad incident that happened this morning, so far we have received 16 casualties, in which nine were killed and others wounded. We had shifted three seriously wounded to combined military hospital. I myself and my staff are here treating others. And finally, in our news, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese will embark on a visit to India, which will last until March 11th. That comes at the invitation of Indian Prime Minister Nari Nadra Modi. Prime Minister Albanese, who is arriving on his first visit as a Prime Minister, is scheduled to discuss with his Indian counterpart at the annual Australian-India Summit to be held in New Delhi. Issues related to trade, investment, renewable energy and technology, and cooperation in the fields of defense and security all shall be discussed. And with this, we reach the end of our program. For more, you can always visit our social media platforms. From me and the rest of the team, thank you for tuning in and bye for now.